We are happy to greet all of you who are attending worship this day, either in person or online. As always, remember that no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, that you are always welcome here. We are so blessed at St. Paul's United Church of Christ to have so much musical talent available to us. Please note that there is one change in our monthly rotation of music ensembles. Today would have normally been a handbell Sunday, but it was necessary to move the bells to next Sunday, the 22nd, due to a conflict in Kristen's schedule. Special thanks to Linda Kranz for agreeing to fill in today in Kristen's absence. So, at this point, we hope that you have enjoyed this brief time before worship to visit with your neighbors, but now we want you to inv invite you to use the next few minutes during the musical prelude to prepare your minds and your hearts and to quiet your voices for worship. rise in body and spirit and join me in our call to worship. Abundance everywhere. A delicate spider's web sparkling with morning dew. A crisp apple and the smell of pumpkin pie. God's love and grace. a sense of presence in the quiet moments of prayer. God's blessings. Generous and abundant. Causing us to sing. And 24, sing to the Lord of Harvest.
Please join me in our prayer of invocation. <coughs> Gracious God, you are the vine grower who tenderly prepares the ground and selects the good stock. Through the words and the love of your Son, gently prune the dead parts of our lives, that which has grown rotten, decayed by our resentments, our pride, our self-centeredness, and our greed. Help us to draw deeply upon the nourishment of the true vine, that we, the branches, may bear the rich fruits of the life of the resurrection. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mr. Cruz and I'm here to share a children's message with our youngest Christians here in Sanctuary and online. You may have noticed I have a deck of cards with me here this morning because I have this really cool card trick I want to share with you. And I've already attained the assistance of a lovely assistant here in the front row to help me with this trick. All right, here we go. Are you ready? I want you to pick a card, any card from the deck. No, not that one. <laughs> any card. Not that one. This one. Try that one. Okay, now don't show it to me but you can show it to everyone else. I'll keep my eyes covered so I can't see it. Okay, I want you to put the card back into the middle of the deck, but don't show it to me. <laughs> All right, the card is safely in the middle of the deck. And here comes the magic. I'm gonna snap my fingers and your card is gonna travel from the middle to the top. Everybody ready? Here we go. Take a look and see if that's your card. <laughs> that's your card, isn't it? No. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no. I don't know what happened. What could have practiced? <laughs> Thank you, lovely assistant. <laughs> I don't know what it could have gone wrong. I I got this book and it was telling me how to do this trick. All I had to do, she was going to pick a card, put it in the middle of the deck, I was going to snap my fingers, and it was going to rise to the top. But it didn't work. I don't know what went wrong. Well, I have to admit, there was a lot of other instructions I was supposed to do and follow, but I didn't want to take the time to read it. It was too complicated. I wanted the easy way out. And that's kind of silly of me that this car trip didn't work. Anyway, that's pretty foolish of me. And sometimes in life, we think the same way. We think that everything should happen with the snap of our fingers. When life is hard, we look for the easy way out. And that's nothing new, you know. People were like that in Jesus' day, too. 
And in our Bible lesson today from the book of Mark in chapter 8, we learn of Jesus telling his disciples about all the things he was going to have to suffer to save the world from wrongdoing, what we call sin. He told them how he was going to be made fun of, how he was going to be beaten, and how he would be killed and buried. But that on the third day, he would rise again. That's what his father had sent him to do. But one of the disciples, Peter, Peter had other ideas. Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. But Peter didn't want death for Jesus. Peter thought there had to be another way, an easier way. Well, it's true. There was an easier way. Jesus had the power. He could have snapped his fingers right there and established his kingdom there and then. But that wasn't God's plan. Peter, I'm sorry, Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You don't have your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. You see, Jesus wasn't interested in taking the easy way out. And he doesn't want us looking for the easy way out either. Jesus said, if anyone is to follow me, he should deny himself and pick up his cross to follow me. And what Jesus means by that, he's asking us to give something up in our lives in order to follow him. Things like taking time to come to church and learn about him, coming to Sunday school, reading the Bible or being read the Bible. Taking time to pray. God wants a relationship with each and every one of us. He wants to hear from us. He wants to know what we're feeling. He wants us to ask him for guidance. And he wants us to practice making good choices and to be kind, loving Christians. Being a follower of Jesus isn't easy. It doesn't happen with the snap of a finger. It's not easy, but the reward is great. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. Would you bow your heads as I say a prayer? Heavenly Father, help us be willing to take up our cross and follow Jesus. We know it won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. If you're following along, it is on page 1566 of your pew Bible. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do you people say I am? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not know, not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world 
and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. still remember being on the phone with the composer, Brian Sergio, uh, who's a UCC pastor and a very successful uh, songwriter. And he literally ex instructed me over the phone on uh, how to play uh, the chords in the song, which was uh, quite a gift. Jesus and the twelve were walking down the road one day. He asked them, who do people say I am? They told him the things they'd heard in towns along the way. And how his name had spread throughout the land. Listen to their answers, and as he did, he knew that the greater truth about him had been missed. And when they stopped their talking, Jesus asked them, How about you? That's when Simon Peter said something like this Jesus. We believe you are the Christ. Everything has changed since you came into our lives. And we don't care what people say. We're going to follow in your way. Jesus, we believe you are the Christ. I still hear his question, who do people say I am? I listen to the answers people give. Some say Jesus was no more than a charismatic man. And others have their doubts he even lived. Some say he was a teacher of some sound philosophy who'd enjoyed a trumped-up place in his story. Some say he was a dreamer who was dangerously naive. But there's still only one response that speaks for me. Jesus, I believe you are the Christ. Everything has changed since you came into my life. And I don't care what people say. I'm going to follow in your way. Jesus, I believe you are the Christ. Jesus, I believe you are the Christ. Grace and peace be to you all from God our Creator and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this day that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable to our God, who is our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Scripture tells us that Jesus and his disciples did a lot of traveling, and it was mostly on foot. 
And while they would walk, Jesus would often talk. In today's story, they're walking in the Roman territory near Caesarea Philippi. And it's here that Jesus gives his disciples a pop quiz of sorts. Okay, first question. Who do people say I am? Well, that's easy, Jesus. And so the disciples give a quick answer, a sort of, what's the word on the street about Jesus? Well, you know, some say uh, you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Uh, and still others say you're one of the prophets. Great. Second question. But who do you say that I am? Now, I can kind of imagine Peter stumbling a little bit. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say? We've all been in that situation where we're trying to process a question and come up with the best answer, and we stall a little bit. Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah. That Peter, what a brown noser. A little well-known fact is that the Jewish title Messiah, in Hebrew, of course, it's Christ in Greek. Messiah, Christ, same word, or same concept, just one is Hebrew, one is Greek, okay? But that particular title, whether you use Messiah or Christ, was a title reserved for the anointed one. Specifically, a royal figure from the line of David who was expected to come and free Israel from their oppressors and restore Israel's independence and glory, but more like a military figure, if you understand the origin of the concept of Messiah or Christ the anointed one. So in short, Peter's claim that Jesus was the Christ was to say, in essence, uh, Jesus, I think you're the one who will reestablish Israel's supremacy among the nations and usher in a new era of peace and holiness. We're expecting big things from you, Jesus. The problem here is that Jesus himself has not given any indication of such claims to royalty. These were all things that others said about him. He never spoke of it. Such claims to royalty. And he certainly said nothing about his political ambitions, which would also be something associated with Messiah. Or Christ. In other words, Jesus hasn't said or done anything that is particularly Christ-like in the traditional sense of the title. How ironic. How ironic that Jesus hasn't made any claims about being the Messiah. No mention of him spearheading an overthrow of the Roman Empire or ushering in a new kingdom in an earthly sense. And perhaps that's why Jesus warns his disciples to keep things on the down low. For Jesus knows that these feeble-minded followers are still very far from truly grasping who he is or what his intentions really are. But then what follows are the words that the disciples really don't want to hear. Namely, Jesus talk about rejection, suffering, and death. And so that's why, Peter, uh, that's why Peter quickly dispels these claims. And he kind of takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. You know what the definition of the word rebuke is? An expression of sharp disapproval or criticism. So Peter 
is disapproving of what Jesus is saying and criticizing him for it. No, 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 Jesus, this is not the way it's supposed to go. The Messiah is supposed to conquer the Romans, not get killed by them. What good is a dead Messiah? And this is when Jesus, at least this is how I read it, this is when Jesus starts to lose patience with Peter and why he rebukes Peter. Remember the word abuke, an expression of sharp disapproval or criticism? So now Jesus is disapproving and criticizing what Peter is saying, and he says, get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter, you little devil, you. How can I make you understand? It's not at all what you think. Fact is, it's really more about building. It's about establishing God's new realm. A realm not of this world. And then, as the text says, pulling the whole crowd together, because up to this point, it's kind of a private conversation. Now Jesus pulls the whole crowd together and then provides some basic instructions of how this will all be accomplished. Just how the divine realm will become reality. In short, that his purpose will be accomplished one life at a time. Get the picture? To be blunt, Jesus is saying to them, as a group, addressing them as a group, but implying that it's an individual thing that needs to happen. In short, that his purpose will be accomplished one life at a time, and to be blunt, he says, if you want to be part of this new reign of God, then all you have to do is follow me. But, before you step over that line, before you opt in, you need to be prepared. You need to know exactly what you're getting into. Because it ain't going to be no picnic. Frankly, it's going to get messy. If any want to become my followers, then deny yourselves. That's an important one. Deny yourselves and take up your cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. It's great that it's football season because you can use these great analogies of the coach having this little pep talk on the sidelines or in the locker room. Take a knee, men. If you want to play on my team, then the first thing you need to know is this. Of course, the coaches say there is no I in team. But in this particular setting, as if Jesus were the coach addressing the team, there is no I in disciple. Yeah, I, I know there's two I's in disciple. But you know what? If you want to play on words there, you're going to need both of those I's in order to be able to see the real vision God has for ushering in God's realm on earth as it is in heaven. If you want to play on my team, you need to let go of your sense of me first. For I, as in me, is synonymous with the human ego. So what he's saying is you need to let go of your ego. 
as individuals. You matter because your ability to contribute to the greater whole of this community of believers, that's important, to have your individuality and to be able to contribute to the whole and to the cause. For we are united by the same Spirit. We are a community of believers that is indivisible in God's eyes. So let's get out there and take one for the team. Self-denial is something we all struggle with. And yes, the ego is the problem. So often, we think of self-denial as a life without creature comforts, or life without pleasure, or life without the things that can make us happy. Or worse yet, we think of self-denial as meekness, as passiveness, as subjection, or giving away our power. But selfless discipleship is so much more than that. Self-denial goes right down to the very roots of who we are and what, what we value most in our lives. To put it into context, we go back to 16th century theologian John Calvin, who describes self-denial as the sum of of the Christian life. You hear that, folks? Self-denial is the sum of the Christian life. It is important, therefore, to remember that self-denial is not about squashing our own selfish desires or delaying gratification. Self-denial is certainly not the same as self-annihilation or self-deprecation. Rather, self-denial is a complete redefinition of who we are. To be blunt, the kind of self-denial that Jesus speaks of is simply about putting the needs of others before our own. About practicing humility, about empowerment, about equality, about team building, and it's about building others up. Because you can't build others up if it's all about me. Or me first. And when I preach on this concept, there's always an important disclaimer. Self-denial has never been, or will it ever be, about, about embracing suffering for the sake of it. Neither should our ability to tolerate suffering itself be considered a virtue. Do not, therefore, I repeat, do not ever allow this text to become an excuse for abusive behavior or to justify any form of victimization. And that goes for victims as well as perpetrators. Yes, we can even use that cliche. We've come a long way, baby, especially when it comes to women's rights and their role. And so many who feel that at some level that being a victim is acceptable when it's not. To be blunt, and I know there's been several blunts in this message, cross-bearing should never be a way to rationalize pain or abuse. Oh, it's just one of the many crosses I have to bear. No! Because cross-bearing means much more than patience and tolerance and obedience or accepting the weightiness of our lives. Cross-bearing is all about personal transformation. Simply put, cross-bearing means humbly dying to oneself and then rising out of the ashes in order to best practice what Christ preaches. 
denying and dying to one's self. And again, we struggle with this in our culture. For us in the 21st century, taking up our cross means putting Jesus' priorities and purposes ahead of our own comfort or security. It means being willing to lose our lives by spending our lives in the service of others, using our time and our resources and our gifts and our energy so that others may experience God's love and grace through us as Christ's disciples, as those who follow Jesus and deny ourselves, if we truly take that line seriously. As Christ's disciples, we need to shed our unearthly, non-social, idealistic, romantic, and uber-spiritual visions of the kingdom and get back to what Jesus meant. By kingdom, Jesus meant God's ideal society on earth spreading out from the land of Israel to encompass the whole world. And those who aren't following, those who do not deny themselves, those who aren't following this simple vision aren't really behaving like true Jesus followers. It's that simple. Because followers actually follow. And to follow. To follow Jesus means to follow him by proclaiming and promoting a society where justice rules. Where there is enough for all. And where love shapes everything. It's that simple. And so we pray. Today I'd like to even think of ourselves as a prayer and not just in the act of praying, but to actually be prayer in what we say and what we do. And I think we'll have an opportunity this morning for anyone who wishes to share, so if an usher can be prepared with a microphone, that would be great. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. a prayer let our hearts be a cry humble our heart so that you may draw nigh cause us to stand and cry out for this land cause us to be a people set free to stand as a house of prayer. Make me a prayer, let my prayer be a cry. Humble my heart so that you may draw nigh. Cause me to stand and cry out for this land. Cause me to be one who's set free to stand as a house of prayer.
us a prayer let our prayers be a cry humble our hearts so that you may draw nigh cause us to stand and cry out for this land cause us to be a people set free to stand as a house of prayer Loving God, we turn our hearts and our minds and our voices to you in prayer, asking that you hear our prayers, but that you help us to make our prayers actions, that we may be about the change, that we may be, may be about your work in this place and beyond as we deny ourselves and seek to be present for others, knowing that all are deserving of your love and your grace. And as a house of prayer this day, we have concerns that are on our hearts. We have individuals that are feeling a desire to share openly. So at this time, if you have a prayer offering that you would like to share, just put your hand up and we will bring a microphone to you. Any personal prayers or thoughts, things today? I have so many people that are struggling around me. There's Arlene, and there's Wade, and there's Ruth. There are so many that I, that I can't even remember all their names. I have them written down. It's a lot of people that are getting older and more frail and unable to help themselves the way they once could, which makes it so difficult for them. But my prayer is that I will be able to continue to help them where they need and provide what I can, that I can remain strong and have the energy and sometimes not Mm, get into myself and start resenting that I have no time left. So um, if we could all look around to those people that are around us that are struggling mm -hmm. and just need even a phone call a day or a meal here and there or a ride to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, my prayer is that we look for those people. A ministry of caring. So thank you. May God hear those concerns and that commitment to help and serve others. I just have a thank you. Um, a good friend of Mary Ann's has donated some money towards the kitchen, and the kitchen is now almost 100% complete. It's beautiful. So if you'd like to go down and take a look at it, um, it's, it's one of the nicest things in our church. Amen. Well, we give thanks for that opportunity and for those who supported that. And yes, we will all want to take a look. So we give thanks. Are there other prayers, concerns, or just general thoughts or observations? Absolutely. Let it be for the whole community. Amen to that. Make us a prayer, 
Let our prayers be a cry Humble our hearts So then you may draw nigh Cause us to stand And cry out for this land Cause us to be a people set free To stand as a house of prayer Hear our prayers, O God, incline your ear to us and grant us your peace. As we pray together now the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to take, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. <clears throat> Once again, we greet you in the spirit of loving kindness, and we are thankful for the many newsworthy items as we celebrate the community of Christ that we are here at St. Paul's United Church of Christ. My name is Wendy Manser, and I want to thank you for joining us for worship today, either in person or online. Um, as always, if you haven't already done so, please sign the attendance book located on your pews and pass it along to the other folks in your pews. Uh, the beautiful flowers this morning are uh, from Jean and Dick Hautzinger in gratitude for his, their St. Paul's community and family. We could not sustain our ministry without the generous support of our members and friends, if you do not choose to drop your offering in the offering plates during the musical offertory, you can always find the donation link on our website, or you can always mail in your gift. Next Sunday will be Pastor Bob's last official Sunday as our interim pastor. We hope you will all want to join us in bidding him farewell as he moves on to his next ministry setting in Algonquin, Illinois, where he will serve as the interim pastor of the Congregational United Church of Christ of Algonquin. I also want to give a reminder once again that our next congregational meeting will be October 20th, immediately following the service. It should be a short one. And I know Linda's not here, but I was just happening to look outside at the bulletin board and all the goodies that she's put up about the crop walk. And I've noticed that there's a lot of empty lines on all the volunteer spaces. So please, if you can't walk, that's fine, but there's a lot of opportunities. We, as a host church, want to put our best foot forward. So please consider donating your Saturday time for that. So that given, I guess that's about all I have for announcements. Please join me in our call to offering. <coughs> we shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which we harvest from the land that God has given us. We will put it in a basket and go to the place that our God will choose as a dwelling for God's name. Let us bring our first fruits to God.
join me in dedicating our gifts. Creator God, you have given us dominion over all the earth. With this covenant to care for the earth, we are called to give our time, talent, and gifts. Bless the time we give, that it may be purposeful. Bless the talent we bring, that it may have meaning. Bless the gifts we bear, so that they are given in pure love. Thanks be to you, our Creator. Amen. For our closing song today, <clears throat> please turn in your hymnals to page 718 and join me in Fourth in Your Name. joy, our joy, uh, with the arrival of our new grandchild, uh, Alan Joseph Wang. Um, we're very fortunate to spend a few days this past week um, with him and with his parents, uh, so uh, certainly a joy, uh, and many of you can certainly relate to that, uh, but I uh, just wanted to share that little update with you, and I do have a few pictures on my phone uh, if you uh, are interested in seeing them, so. And now may the peace of God abide in you and the love of Christ fill your hearts and may the power of the Holy Spirit sustain you this day and forevermore. And may you go in peace. Amen. <laughs>